Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's PhD podcast. Today, I'm very glad to welcome Brian Hurley. Brian is a proud Tipperary man, and he studies in the whole area of applied linguistics. So we're going to be very, very interested to hear about to hear from Brian and about his PhD and the kind of research that he's undertaking and just what he has in terms of career aspirations. And, uh, you know, and just to give us some insight into how he's life as a PhD researcher is here at the University of Limerick. So Brian, you're very welcome to this podcast and thank you very much for taking the time. Hi Brian, so thank you so much for taking the time to be here today and to give your insights and uh, your expertise with regard to your research. Could you just give us a little bit of background about yourself first, Brian? Yeah, so I started, I suppose my academic career started in Watford. Um, I began with a BA in English and Sociology um, and after Waterford, I worked for a time in PR um, and mainly kind of worked in marketing, PR and media, uh, predominantly working with small businesses uh, to kind of generate a um, bit of public relations and a bit of, uh, I suppose, public interest in their businesses and stuff like that. I, I mainly kind of specialize in small and medium enterprises um, and working with those to kind of build their online profiles and things like that. Um, and I did that, I suppose, for a few years. I also taught English as a foreign language in Limerick for a while. And it was kind of uh, just, uh, I suppose, after I started teaching in um, Limerick, teaching English as a foreign language, that I got kind of interested again in maybe going back and doing a bit of study myself. So I started talking to my um, my uh, former lecturer in Watford who mentioned uh, applied linguistics. And uh, that's how I kind of came, to, I suppose, to be interested or it came into the realm of applied linguistics in University of Limerick. Great. And just in terms of your PhD, Brian, then, Brian, you know, where did this, you know, interest, you obviously had the interest, obviously, you know, that that was kind of um, engendered there down in Waterford with regard to applied linguistics. But where did, it, where did it come about, you know, the interest in doing a PhD in the whole area of applied linguistics? Because it's quite, quite a step, you know, to yeah. have a, an initial interest to doing a PhD in the area. Yeah, exactly. So I suppose I started when I started the MA, I'd kind of always had an interest in the kind of fusion of language and society and how language is used within society um, and how we kind of navigate the world through different kind of um, context specific frames that are built by discourse and language. Um, so I suppose I started off mainly just doing the MA and it was only once I kind of started into the module of sociolinguistics um, and studying a bit more on how language impacts society and the role of language in society um, that I kind of gotten into thinking about okay well maybe I want to do a bit more further research into this and actually carry on and maybe make a career out of this like you know um, so I kind of actually got talking to my uh, supervisor at the time or the uh, career head or the um, module leader, um, Marie, Dr. Maria Wright, reader, um, and she kind of told me, you know, encouraged me, I suppose, to think of a topic to maybe go forward and do a PhD. Um, and I, I suppose the idea for the actual subject topic came from, I left school in 09, uh, finished my leaving cert in 09 and kind of came out into a, an Ireland that when I was growing up was going through this amazing boom. And suddenly when I came out of, of uh, secondary school there was nothing no jobs no real kind of avenues or pathways into um, any form of kind of solid um, work or anything like that so I kind of basically um, I remember thinking at the time that it was this there was this kind of an odd feeling around the place and, and nobody kind of knew what what they were doing or where where to go or what to do and and it kind of I saw the media and I saw how all of these institutions kind of were almost using language to kind of, I suppose, using language to kind of build their own idea of the the world that was around them and to create a reality that I never saw in my world, you know. Um, and that's where my first interest, I suppose, in how language can be applied within uh, social structures, that's kind of where it first came from. Um, and then as I kind of moved forward, I moved to Australia for a while and moved. I worked in various countries in Europe and places like that. And I think it was Denmark that was the first country where I lived that I kind of first saw how I suppose a society works when 
you get things right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember working there and I, I only worked as a fruit picker. I was only 19 at the time. And it was just, it was amazing how organized and how kind of thoughtful they all were. Even when you spoke to people, I, I used to work in, like speaking to people if you went out or I spoke to a lot of younger people in like Copenhagen, places like that. And I was shocked by how knowledgeable they were about not just kind of, like about their culture and about their society and about how the social structures work, how the political structures mm. work, how all these economic structures work. Like they were very, they were far more knowledgeable than myself and my friends who were their same age coming from Ireland, but we had no idea as to kind of any rights or anything that we were kind of mm. due, you know? Um, and I, and my experience in Denmark definitely kind of set a tone for how I was going to approach my study in the preceding years, you know. Um, so then after, look, after I spent a year in Australia working, um, building sites and all this thing, and it had always been a kind of goal to go back and study at university and to go back and do, a, well, I was originally planning on being an English and history teacher. Um, so I went back and studied, started studying English and sociology. Um, and it was, I suppose, in Watford where I met a, a lecturer, uh, Dr. John O'Brien, who kind of encouraged me, I suppose, a bit more to start writing um, and a, a bit more to kind of start maybe kind of moving into the, the realm of media and writing articles and uh, writing press releases and getting used to kind of working with all these businesses and stuff like that. Um, and that's where I started working, I suppose, first as a my first kind of gig, I suppose, as a journalist working with a Canadian media company who were bit interested at the time, basically, in the whole move, water movement in Ireland and the Irish water protests and stuff like that. So um, myself and a couple of friends decided, you know, we'll take this on and we'll build our own little media platform. So. We basically decided that we'd uh, go off and we'd cover all this um, Irish water protests and stuff like that. And and again, I suppose that was another kind of stepping stone towards where I'm heading at the moment. Mm. Again, you saw the role of language in society and the role of how all these institutions use language in society and things like that. So it kind of moved on from there, really. And I've always had an interest from, I suppose, that day forward was always interesting to me, I suppose, was this role of language in society and was this role of discourse especially um almost why people think certain things are true and why these things become true and this uh kind of i suppose the idea around common knowledge um has been recently been my kind of main focus of study i suppose you know okay fantastic brian and then that's really fascinating to hear about your background uh you know so diverse and so um you know in, intriguing to, to have that you know like to have such a kind of a checkered background to come and to bring that into your you know into in it to bring the, all of that experience and knowledge and intercultural awareness into other you know into your into your research but how then did you end up doing a PhD at specifically at the University of Limerick? Yeah, yeah so I suppose what kind of made me, um, after talking to Maria, uh, I was kind of always wanting, UL has always kind of interested me from the point of view that it's my local university. Mm. Um, it's also, for me, I think the role of academics should be within their local area. So for me, I think to do a PhD in my local area and to actually, you know, use my local area as my kind of uh, data set and my topic um, is important because the University of Limerick, like I said, it, it's one of those institutions which has been grown uh, by, I suppose, over the last 20 years, I would say, the University of Limerick has grown to this really solid internationally recognized institution. Mm. Um, and to me, like I said, to me, it's a great um, opportunity, but also it's, uh, I suppose, a personal thing as well that I, I'm just uh, proud to be able to go and do my PhD in my local area um, and to represent the University of Limerick, I suppose, um, given all the opportunities that they've given me, to be honest. OK, fantastic. And tell us, Brent, what are you working on right now? You know, and do you have a do you have like a next milestone with regard to your PhD? What what kind of research yes. are you undertaking at the moment? So at the moment, it's actually, I suppose anyone doing the PhD the first year is predominantly reading. So <laughs> you just read. <laughs> 
So like uh, my, I suppose I'm kind of nearing the end of that process now. So now it's about developing what kind of case studies I'm going to look mm. at and um, what my data set is going to be basically and where I'm, I'm going to be looking into areas of kind of multinational corporations and different, um, say, tax free zones within the Irish state and things like that. So it's about kind of narrowing it down now and narrowing down the literature so that I'm able to kind of look at my case study and go, OK, well, this is what I want to focus on from now on. I think it's a good idea um, or I think it worked for me anyway, was uh, to start very broad with your idea and mm -hmm. narrow things bit by bit. So we're nearly approaching that stage now where we're, we've just about nearly hit the nail on the head. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And I suppose my next question would be about, you know, what's a typical day with regard to your PhD? But at the moment, I suppose it is predominantly, re it is predominantly as you outlined yeah. it. It is, yeah. I mean, it's, look, the day is, uh, as a PhD as well, it's not like, I mean, when you're just doing your PhD, there's other activities, I suppose, that you do as well. Mm. You know, I obviously do tutoring and I do uh, a lot of other kind of additional work to help fund the PhD, but also mm. to gain more experience myself, I suppose, in this field. So, like, the day normally consists of start early, start reading, start developing your notes. I think note taking is as important as reading, to be quite honest, mm. and being able to organize your notes and being able to organize the um, the literature uh, as it comes out. So that that's kind of one of the main roles that you do during the day. And then, of course, you like I said, you're always looking for opportunities for like doing the likes of this podcast or writing an article or you kind of have to be flexible, I think, uh, doing a PhD and you have to be I suppose, willing to kind of put yourself out there and to put a, a bit of effort and work in behind it as well. Yeah, great. And at the moment, Brian, I know you're still at the very early stages of your mm. of, of your PhD, but has there been an instance, you know, where you have encountered a, a problem and, you know, would you be able to give us some example of maybe yeah. some issue that you encountered and how you confronted that and even perhaps overcame that also? Yeah, so like one of the, I suppose, one of the, Big, uh, uh, and it's always an issue, I think, with every PhD is with regard to kind of funding and how do you kind of, how do you even, how do you go about it? Like, you know, because it's a mm. daunting task when you first begin to kind of, when you look at the fees and you're thinking, oh my God, how am I going to afford all this? Like, you know, um, but one of the things I suppose that I kind of worked on with my PhD and, and one of the challenges I kind of came up against was definitely at the beginning trying to balance doing your studies with work and you know funding mm. yeah. um and i suppose how i overcame it was by again i think you have to think very carefully about the area you're going into but also try and i suppose think very carefully about how what sort of job you can take on uh while you're doing your phd mm. so i was very lucky i was able to take on a teaching uh english language job which was very flexible and very kind of worked very well for me because i was able to kind of use work around it basically work mm. work phd around it and i think that's an important um kind of it's an important roadblock that you have to get around if you're doing a phd unless obviously look there's people that get fully funded phds and that's the best one of all but for most of us, you don't get a fully funded PhD. You might get a partially funded one. So it's about trying to, I suppose, um, ensure that you're able to have a life alongside the PhD as well. Um, and that's an important, it's that balance again between, you know, we all have to work hard and we all are, you know, put an awful lot of hours and time and effort into this. But it's important as well to realize that you have to strike that balance as well. And I think in the current climate, we the mental health issues we're having and stuff that's an important kind of um like i said an important roadblock that you have to learn to navigate you know yeah it's huge actually yeah that, no that's that's yeah. really fascinating just you know and the whole issue of funding you know such a it is a you know it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a deal breaker actually for so many people like you know yeah. whether you know if they can get funded in an institution it makes such a you know that leads a lot of people actually to you know um towards a particular institution rather mm. than you know in preference to one maybe that might have been higher on their list of preferences yeah. you know um so yeah it's just it's it's it it really uh, can make such uh, such a difference you know so hearing your perspective of you know being a self-funded student yeah that's a that's that's an interesting one because yeah mm. we don't come across uh too many self-funded students necessarily no. you know like completely self-funded you know exactly. so that's uh, yeah look I mean, I think it's one of those where um, 
I had a similar thing with the MA, to be honest, where I didn't, again, never got funded for the MA. So it kind of, to me, it was always one of those where you just just get on and do with it. Mm-hmm. But again, I think for anyone, like, it's a good um, example set that, like, you know, you don't have to be funded to do a PhD either. You can do it this way, and it is possible to do it this way. It takes work, and it takes effort, and it takes time, but it, it is possible, and it is, you know, it's not something that, should kind of frighten anyone or put someone off doing a PhD. It's something that it's a challenge, I suppose, that you're either willing to accept and take on and go with, or, you know, some people, like I said, it is a step too far, but it just, I suppose it's a nice thing to highlight because it's one of those issues that always comes up with people doing PhDs is their, the funding side of it yeah. and who they're going to fund themselves. So like I said, it is possible to self fund it. Um, and I've, I, I'm doing it at the moment pretty successfully. So, um like i said it's i think it's important that all this anyone that's looking to do it is realizes that funding isn't be all and end all and you can still do a phd with it without it like you know okay so brian i'm just gonna ask you um that's all really that's really fascinating but i'm just gonna ask you about um you know we hear so much about impact you know and obviously from what you've said earlier it's 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 pretty obvious that you know you have assessed and you've thought about and contemplated the Im- you know, potential impact of your research what would you like the impact or the you know even to if you were to talk about what the potential impact of your research could be what would you like it to be i think the most important thing that could come from it would be the acknowledgement i suppose of um, the acknowledgement that there are there isn't just one way to work a society there isn't just one way that we have to go about this and that actually like I think in the modern societies we are often kind of feel like we're pigeonholed a lot of times mm. there's kind of only one way you can go and do this stuff like it. and it kind of filters I suppose on from the talk we were just having about uh, the funding like I mean there are ways you can go about this and do this. And I think in Ireland, we've become very kind of, um, I suppose we've become very confined to how we think about economics and how we think mm. about social structures and how we think about class and race mm. and all these things. And it, it, it's not surprising. I mean, Ireland, you have to, it's a, it's a young country. So like, it's a young country. And I think as a young country, we are only developing this a kind of a, a way of, of doing things ourselves, you know? Um, and I think it's important, what my study I would hope adds to is the beginning of a kind of a, a critical discourse analysis mm. culture in Ireland, where we can critique ourselves and we can critique our belief systems and our uh, economic system, and, mm. and, and any form of institutions that we don't, that need to be critiqued or need to be examined, that we can examine them not through a, uh, through the mediums of kind of online social media platform mm. or, you know, kind of monitored TV shows or stuff like that. Uh, true, genuine kind of discourse and genuine kind of uh, people talking together and people trying to come to solutions together through discourse, you know. Um, if I was, that that would be kind of one of my, that'd be one of my hopes, I suppose, for what mm. the study could achieve. Um, yeah, fantastic. Because, you know, as you say, you know, with regard to social media, people, you know, you talk about people in silos or, you know, or, or, or forms of thinking within silos. But a lot of that kind of, um, you know, that kind of uh, very constrained thinking for me seems to be amplified even further on social media, you know, where you're um, where the, the, the chance of nuance is very very constrict you know is very yeah. restricted and it's managed it's micromanaged social media is micromanaged essentially like you know your kind of what you put out there tends to dictate what groups you get put into yeah uh, yeah you know, if exactly. you start following things or you start following certain people you'll start to probably see more people who follow that same person you know so it's a kind of a managed uh platform where yeah. you won't even get to see uh external ideas from your own you you kind of only see your own little world of kind of stories and uh discourse and look that isn't i i do i again i'm i'm one of those where maybe i'm just a bit over optimistic about it or something but i do think that we will sort that out and i, I do think that social media has the potential to actually be a very good um and very useful tool for future kind of development and but at the moment 
again, we we need to have the conversation. Um, and in Ireland, we kind of have this weird um, relationship, I suppose, with social media companies and that where we we're kind of reliant on them an awful lot as well for our economic stability and our progress and stuff like that. So. You see with the whole Apple tax case recently and Facebook out in Australia and things like that. I think the kind of battle between the state and these private media companies is only just beginning. And I think mm. it's something probably going to become a lot more to the fore now in the next couple of years. Um, and I, I, I would imagine you'll see a lot more um, legislation and things like that over the next few years involved with it as well, you know. Yeah, that seems almost inevitable. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. Uh, could we just hear about, you know, what your career aspirations would be after you graduate, you know, and I presume it's not working for one of the big social media companies. But <laughs> sorry. Depends on how much money that is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I suppose what my ideally like I would love to um, I'd love to for go working for research basically, but uh, as well as that, I do believe that um, the creation of an institution an Irish institution uh, that would examine issues of ideology based in media, that would examine issues of ideology based in political discourse, um, political campaigns, things like that. And that would actually, that would work in a similar fashion to like the ESRI or CSO or any of these organizations that would basically, ma not uh, would monitor and would provide information on the kind of ideological um, pointers that are often put in these kind of texts and talk that we're used to in everyday society, you know, so that would be like, a, I would love to be a part of a, kind of a process like that of creating a, an institution like that. Um, but all, like I said, also just the, uh, the opportunity, I suppose, to carry on my research would be the main goal, I suppose, really. Um, even if it is working for one of those social media companies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us, Brian, uh, what would you say, you know, you have so much, so much experience, as you said, you talked about your work, you know, with small and medium enterprises, you know, and uh, and all your um, experience in the in the world of, in the world outside of academia. But what would you say, you know, would be the advantage to you of doing a PhD instead of doing something, you know, that somebody with your career, with your qualifications, you know, would be expect what you know rather than work that some with your qualifications would be expected to do at this stage mm -hmm. of your career. You know, what would you say is the advantage of doing a PhD rather than following a career path at this stage? I suppose one of the major advantages of doing a PhD is the opportunity to network with individuals from all. Like again, I got a, I recently got an opportunity to work on an international project where. You know, you get to meet uh, researchers in a, who are, are of a similar mind and a, are working in a similar field, and and you're meeting these people from all over the world. And I think doing you wouldn't. It's not that the opportunities aren't there with, without with or without a PhD. It's it's the fact that the PhD allows and gives you this platform mm. to be able to go and do these things. And and I think that's uh, it, it's a wonderful opportunity to be quite honest to be able to take on. Um, and it, uh, again, it's one of those things that I feel very lucky to have been able to take on, um, especially at this uh, at a later stage. Like it's, I, I, I kind of came back to academia rather than went through academia, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, fantastic. And so just the last question then, Brian, would be um, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking of doing a PhD? Um, I would definitely, it's one of those where I, I, I always think that like, a PhD in one way to me is a sort of a marathon, not a sprint. And you kind of, it's a, it's a more a test of your endurance and your ability to kind of continue to be, uh, a re, a, to continue to research and continue to kind of test yourself and motivate yourself, you know. Um, it's a wonderful kind of personal, um, kind of personal journey that you go on, you know, uh, because it is a lot of the time you are working on your own and you are, kind of using your own motivations and stuff like that. So like, again, it's I think it's as, uh, as much character development and character building as anything else. And it's a real test and sign of character mm. to be able to get through um, the PhD and complete it, you know. So my, my advice is to kind of, you know, think carefully about it and prepare yourself to kind of be prepared to go in and to make the commitment to go through with it, because it is a commitment and it is a mm. It's a process, but it's a very rewarding process if you can, if you're willing to make yeah. that. 
Yeah, that's great, Brian. I think one of the things I wish I knew or wish I'd been told before I started my PhD, and this comes up so much in the literature now, and you hear people like Hugh Kearns talk about this all the time, is just the importance of persistence, you know, and tenacity, yeah. you know, and just how, you know, yes, talent is one thing, but persistence and tenacity yeah. are so much more important traits, you know, with regard to doing a PhD, you know, than, yeah, it, than that's the main one is you have persistence. You have to be kind of relentless almost in how you pursue it, you know? Yeah, because um, you're going to go through so many disappointments on the way, on the way, you know, exactly. things that, you know. And like everything, there's ups and downs, I suppose, on every, no matter what you do, whether you do a, a BA, MA or yeah. PhD, there's always going to be an ups and downs. And I suppose the good thing about the PhD or the kind of great, um, reward you get is, is being able to test yourself and, and also as well as that like to know as well that you're you kind of have a lot of safety nets under you to, like I mean mm. the University of Limerick there's fantastic supports there for PhD students so you kind of have the safety nets so it gives you the kind of the confidence to say all right go on I'll, I'll take it on and I'll, I'll go forward with it you know. Yeah fantastic Brian that's brilliant uh, thank yes, you sir. so much for your insights uh, into your research into your background you know uh, your um, uh, just your you, the way that you've uh, thought about your research is really is, is so refreshing you know just to hear about you know the uh, way you, that you want to take it and the potential impact of it you know like is really that's something which could be you know um pr uh, pretty uh, fascinating actually you yeah. know like and re you know i think that's something which will be you know something from which we can so many of us can benefit you know to get yeah. that kind of you know to, to it's just brilliant to have someone you know with your with your background someone who is you know will say who has come as you say not through academia you know through academia but in, into academia from outside yeah. and seeing the other side of yeah. you know and seeing the 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 world of work before eventually into the academic realm so that's brilliant that's you know really really fascinating i look forward to hearing much more about your research and to reading papers that you write uh, throughout your phd and beyond so thank you so much brian it's been a Thanks, real sir. pleasure to have you today and um uh best of luck with your phd and with your future career so thank you so much brian thanks sir thanks talk very to much. you soon take care thank you brian bye 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 bye